TLC, or The Learning Channel, ironically, may be one of the most brain-rotting channels on TV. I eat fiber supplements so I can go number two as fast as I go number one. Watching TLC, which I've done too much of now, I constantly find myself asking, is this too much? From 90 Day Fiance's toxic couples to the exploitation of children on toddlers and tiaras and even the rise and fall of such figures like Honey Boo Boo, TLC is one of the most storied and controversial written channels on cable. D Jay, do you think that you can be in a monogamous relationship with Ashley? Going through this topic, clicking link after link, not even the cake boss, Buddy Velastro is innocent. You may think his crazy cakes are wholesome, but he's just crazy and has been quoted as saying, you can't arrest me, I'm the cake boss. TLC has ruined lives, lied to its audience, and had to respond to some of the most ridiculous controversies any TV channel has had to respond to. Our relationship is I experience SSA, or same-sex attraction. Not gay. He said, I think you need to know that I'm attracted to men. And I was crushed. I don't identify my husband as being gay either. Yeah, this is Billiam, and today I want to take a deep dive into TLC to find out what makes it one of the worst channels on TV. In my last video, I explored how many of TLC's reality shows are riddled with mistruths and deceptions, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. If you're not familiar with an iceberg chart, it organizes information about a topic from the most well-known info to the least well-known info. So today we're going to be excavating the TLC iceberg. From TLC's greatest hits, biggest controversies, favorite genre of shows, and their most embarrassing flaws. In but my ex-husband's sperm is in my wife. This topic is so f***ing big, I've had to split it up into three videos now, with the third and final part exploring how TLC fell from an educational channel to what we'll see today. Doing this project, I've been watching too much TV. I gotta go have myself a nice night out on the town, and I'm gonna look fresh. Thank goodness my friends at Holes Kern have sent me some fresh new accessories to add to my wardrobe. Holes Kern's a super new, super hip young team from Austria, making natural watches, jewelry and other accessories. Every single piece is unique because of the natural material. It's made with like wood and a variety of stones. It's so natural and so fresh. It's so in touch with nature. That's fresh. I chose the Steric watch. It's so beautiful. I love the green face. I wore it to my sister's bridal shower <laughs> along with the Adagio bracelet. I've also been rocking the Cartesian ring around. It looks great with that bracelet and I need to plan a beach day so I could wear the curious sunglasses out. But if I'm looking for a different vibe, I might wear the a capriccio bracelet like I am today. If you want some of these fresh bad boys for yourself, shipping to the United States and Europe is free and pretty quick, typically taking only two to five days. And my friends at Holes Kern want to hook you guys up with a deal using the code Billium15, which will give you a 15% discount on all of their products. Or you can go to world.holeskern.com slash Billium. A fresh 15. I'm so glad they're my friends. And as long as they're my friend, they're your friends. So thank you, Holes Kern, for keeping me looking fresh as I continue to go down this rabbit hole. In layer one, we're first going to explore TLC's biggest hits from the last few years, starting with 90 Day Fiance, which seems to be TLC's biggest IP and possibly their most successful franchise. The series follows the lives of an American citizen in a long distance relationship with an international partner. The couples have applied for a K-1 visa, which gives them 90 days to decide if they want to tie the knot or if it doesn't work out, their partners are supposed to leave the country. There's a lot of drama in the fact these people are only really getting to know each other for the first time during filming. I imagine it takes a certain kind of person to say yes to going on a show like this, but there's so much tension because there's a lot of consequences if the relationship doesn't work out. I will get your ass departed because you're a User. Like Larissa and Colt just hate each other from moment one. Larissa expects Las Vegas to be this huge metropolitan city like New York and is immediately upset about the reality of it. She fights with Colt's mom the entire time and he's just in the middle of it because they live with his mom. Which is not only cool, but really f***ing cool because it creates moments like this. Larissa and I have had our differences. She's a bitch. However, my favorite part has to be the tell-all at the end of the season where all the couples actually meet each other for the first time and none of them are afraid to let each other know what they think about each other. Tell us what you want. Look at your ass, your body, it's teeny. Okay. Stop it, you Stop it. I want to hear. Larissa and Cole come on to the reunion special late. Jonathan, I don't know you, sir, and I don't care anything about you. But on more than one occasion, be quiet, please. No, are you kidding me? Jay over here was just getting 
on for cheating on his new wife via Tinder. But now he gets the on Larissa and Colt to make himself feel better. Let's calm yeah, down. Yeah, we should bad. definitely take her. Right? You know, I've been here 12 hours and then they come with this. Like, bro, she's oh, dumb. But people on this show have described some of it as being 80% fake with the producers enticing the characters to do things for dramatic effect. Like in one episode, a producer asks this one guy to ask another guy's wife for a massage, all for the camera. I like uh, to get massages. I like Thai massage. So is that something that you would be uh, cool to, you know, uh, volunteer to, to give me a, a massage or something by the pool or? Uh, do you think they're cool after the camera turns off? But sometimes the couples disagree on whether or not the events transpired were truthful. Like Jay insists that Tinder cheating scandal was all made up, but his ex Ashley still talks about it like she was cheated on. So maybe Jay is just trying to save face or maybe Ashley doesn't want to break a contract. But the wildest thing about 90 Day Fiance is the face of the show, Big Ed, has never actually been on the main show. He's only been in like all of the spinoffs. I found out that mayonnaise makes it smoother. I'm self-conscious. We've all at least seen him on the internet. He is hopelessly desperate for love and his 90 day journey started with Rose on Before the 90 Days season four. One of the many spinoffs where the couples meet before they apply for the K-1 visa. You're my best view. Me. I mean You're it. You're so sweet. He's so hopeless saying out of pocket like telling her she has bad breath and getting upset when she's angry about it. So hopeless. Ed tells Rose he wants kids just like she does, then goes to the Philippines and after a few days of meeting her, he mentions he doesn't actually want kids. In fact, he's getting a vasectomy. It's a snip snip. He came into this just hoping to change her mind about this fundamental life choice. So she leaves him without saying goodbye, which is fair because that's just a horrible way to start a relationship. It just hit me. <laughs> He's so hopeless. Then he would reprise his role on 90 Days The Single Life, another spinoff where he met Liz and it didn't work out for him there either. Tell me you're not gonna marry me. I don't need the ring. Go return it, please. I'm happy to leave. Now, I don't get to be with Liz. Now I'm like now. Oh my God, no. You know, now I'm really, you know, I have my dogs. Everyone has opinions on Big Ed and Liz, even Colt's mom. You have no right to give advice, dude. You are about the lowest life. You can't even know. Who says that Ed can only love himself? This guy's a good 20 year old. You don't care about how you feel about somebody. Put in the mayonnaise in your hair. <laughs> We're not supposed to talk about mayonnaise. F you. Oh my God. Oh, oh, shut up. I think you're too close. You don't know shit. On another season of The Single Life, Ed meets Kaori, and since the third time's supposed to be the charm, he is insistent on marrying her, which makes her uncomfortable. They basically just met. Well, can, can I say something? No puedes guardar silencio. Sí. So she ghosts him too. She ghosted me. So hopeless. But hey, maybe it'll work out with Liz again. These guys are so on and off again. They're actually going to be on an upcoming spinoff 90 Day, The Last Resort. They gotta be so fed up with this guy to give the show a title like that. This is your last fucking chance, Big Ed. I feel like everybody knows Buddy the Cake Boss. He and his family make fantastical cakes. Like big pizza cakes, big cheese cakes, big taco cakes, or big hot dog cakes. These thick layers of decorative fondants just to get a crumb of Rice Krispie treats? I thought he was supposed to be the cake boss. It's like the forerunner of those memes where just a little bit of cake is surrounded by all this decorative fondant and it looks like another object, but you know it tastes awful. So I've heard Carlo's Bake Shop actually slaps. Give me like a pastry from the front, not whatever the f this chandelier cake is. Oh shit, buddy forgot to wash the buttercream off his fingers. It's okay, they have a backup, a sheet cake for the guests. They usually have a backup. A backup that considers how inedible all of this fondant hell looks like. And yes, I meant it. After getting arrested for a DUI, cake boss Buddy Velastro was quoted as saying to the arresting officer, you can't arrest me, I'm the cake boss. He pleaded guilty cause he 
was. He wanted to make it right. He paid a $300 fine and received a 90 day suspension on his driver's license. He really pulled a, do you know who I am? Which I have to admit, I will do one time in my life, but not right now. Now we need a show called Cake Boss 90 Day Suspension. Toddlers and Tiaras is about families in the children's beauty pageant world, and it raised a lot of eyebrows during its nine year run, with the events covered in the show often being accused of sexualizing children. With all the exploitation on the channel, it's a real shame that often children were placed in front of TLC's cameras to be leered at by the entire world. This is one of those shows I'm not going to watch. But I did scan a ton of the media coverage surrounding the show, and I found this one article by Slate Magazine to be really poignant into describing the world surrounding the show. It involves a custody battle between one of the star's parents. The court-appointed psychologist described the child's involvement in the show as both premature sexualization and emotionally damaging. The mom in the situation stated a judge using her participation in the show as a reason to take custody away was quote, violating her first amendment rights. This sh is weird and fortunately was canceled a few years ago, but arguably the show's biggest spinoff made more of an impact. Here comes Honey Boo Boo. Here comes Honey Boo Boo followed the self-described redneck lifestyle of a sassy pageant girl named Alana Thompson, better known as Honey Boo Boo, along with her family members, including Mama June. Who won't be calling me, you know, Jahada Hood or whatever, Jah Jada, whatever, Jehuda, Jehuda, whatever. Feels like the TLC Avengers are finally coming together. This kid was hyped up on Mountain Dew and Red Bull like all the time and basically took America by storm, being at the center of media attention. They asked Mitt Romney if he preferred Snooki or Honey Boo Boo. Honey Boo Boo or Snooki? I'm kind of a Snooki fan. So now I have to ask you, who are you going to support for president? Mitt Romney or Barack Obama? Barack Obama. Just the other day, Honey Boo Boo endorsed me. People love them and love to make fun of them to the point of obsession. So that's a big relief. The criticism surrounding the family reached critical mass when Mama June began dating a registered sex offender who had been convicted because of a crime committed against her other daughter, Anna. A really horrific situation. Got even scarier when she confessed to Entertainment Weekly that the father of her two daughters was caught on to catch a predator in 2005. TLC first responded to this controversy by first offering Anna counseling, but ultimately they canceled the show. I think the Hollywood Reporter really had some foresight on the whole situation two years before the show's cancellation. You know the show is exploitation. TLC knows it. Maybe even Mama and Honey Boo Boo know it. Deep down in their rotund bodies. Does that last comment really help the situation? Here comes Honey Boo Boo is a car crash and everybody rubbernecks at a car crash, right? It's human nature. Human nature comes with the capacity to draw a line, to hold fast against the dehumanization and incremental tearing down of social fabric. Since the cancellation, the family has been put back on reality TV with the series Mama June from not to hot, which was initially about her weight loss journey. But after some more trouble, the show was rebranded to Mama June from Not the Hot Family Crisis before its more recent title, Mama June Road to Redemption. Needless to say, it doesn't seem like the reintroduction of the reality TV life has been very helpful to this family. Last time we discussed Breaking Amish's deceitful documentation of Amish and Mennonite people leaving their communities and experiencing the modern world for the first time. In reality, a lot of them had been out of that life for a long time, and the show heavily misrepresents how aware the Amish are of the world beyond their communities. Despite the program being exposed as largely fake, the main cast would do something crazy and return to Amish, a spinoff that has run for seven years. The show introduces a ton of new characters and, and tries to be a little bit more honest about how aware the Amish are of the English or modern world. Oh my goodness, look at that. What is that stuff? Like a lot of different kinds of milk and stuff, doesn't it? Okay, never mind. I watched the latest completed season, Return to Amish Season 6, which centers around two new ex-Amish girls, Rosanna and Marine traveling down to Sarasota, Florida to stay in Marine's grandmother's safe house where other ex-Amish people stay, such as Sabrina and Jeremiah, who appeared in the original series. So I was not expecting to receive a DM from somebody who worked on the production side of Return to Amish. They expressed interest in answering any questions I may have for the next video, and oh boy, I had questions. Respectfully, I'm gonna be keeping their name and position anonymous, but I know they're credible because they appeared in the show. And according to them, it's still fake as f 
quote, at the time of filming, the entire cast was seemingly not following any Mennonite rules except when on camera. I'd say it's like 10% real, 60% dramatizations of things that have already occurred, and 30% totally fake. This is from my own experience though. The major plot points were pretty much all planned out. The edits seemed true to the people I met, the relationships themselves were all real, but all the real stuff happened off camera. For example, Maureen and Danny, her boyfriend, filmed their first kiss when they'd been dating for over a year by that point. The kiss is so long and so awkward. I've left it unedited except for one thing. This doesn't surprise me at all, considering Abe and Rebecca fell in love on screen during Breaking Amish, but in real life, they were already married with kids. It's a lot more reliable way to tell a love story on reality TV than expecting your cast members to fall in love with each other. This whole reenact it and tell you have to fake it routine was something the older cast members had become accustomed to, but something the newer cast members needed to be coached on a little bit more. All to be TV ready. Quote, they would need a little more time to get what the producers wanted than the veteran characters like Ada who knew exactly what to say. Basically, they would be given a rundown of the scene once we got to a location. They would not know where they were going or what they were doing until the day of. From there, they would just go along with the scene as if they were doing it naturally, but the producer would tell them if they wanted specific lines or moments. The finale was completely fake, including the proposal between Maureen and Danny. <sighs> When it's all laid out like this, it becomes so apparently apparent that all of the shows are made like this. I was even told that typically one-off characters like employees at a store or a random passerby that is interviewed would be played by crew members, which is how my contact was able to verify their story. Not only were all of the locations fake, but they weren't even filming in the same state the show takes place in. Absolutely none of that is surprising, and I was informed that in general, the production was a shit show, which often came from producer disagreement or the process of the producers having to convince the actors with going along with scenes they don't want to go along with. According to my inside scoop, the producer spent a lot of time convincing Jeremiah to do a proposal with his girlfriend Carmela, even though neither of them was having it. Imagine your job coercing you to make major life decisions like this. By all means, the audience being lied to is not the most harmful part of this stuff. I would like to add that since Breaking Amish season six, Carmela has filed for a restraining order against Jeremiah. So it's really good they didn't go through with the fucking marriage. I was a little horrified by how mismanaged the production was, as was the rest of the crew, many of which would quit for that reason and be replaced. When asking about whether or not specific moments were faked, I had to ask about Rosanna's panic attack, but instead of saying it was all acted, my source had a different take on the situation. I was not there for Rosanna's panic attack. In hindsight, I am not at all surprised that that had happened. The days were very, very long, and there was no form of counseling or support from TLC. Another moment described to me that I'll be a little bit more vague about involved one of the girls being pressured into wearing a two-piece bathing suit. She was uncomfortable in having to do this because she was on her period. And the producers, who were mostly male, treated the entire situation as a major inconvenience. I wanna reiterate, they would have no idea where they were filming or what they would be doing every day. On this moment, my source did say, I knew reality TV was bad, but that was kind of my wake up call to say, these people. I think companies like TLC really need to be held more accountable for how awful their work environment is. I want to thank our inside informant for taking the time to write to us. Being able to get the behind the scenes perspective really helps to highlight that these are real people's lives that are being fucked with. Moving on to layer two, we're gonna dive into TLC's catalog of shows about relationships, romance, and dating shows. Granted, a lot of them are quirky, like Extreme Cougar Wives, a show featuring older women dating younger men. And they're extreme. This one woman looks like a super villain. But if I see a man that turns me on, I get in this year, TLC took the cougar wife concept and said, well, let's get the whole family involved. Introducing Milk Manor. Milk Manor, <laughs> mommy, I'm mummy, Return of the Dragon Emperor. That's my mom right there. I know one mother I don't wanna fuck. 
but they make it so uncomfortable considering they do all these sexual themed challenges around each other. A new mom and son arrive a few days in and he does an oral demonstration right in front of his mom. I'm about to demonstrate how to kill my- and I'm about to demonstrate how to go to sleep forever. The best dynamic is between Kelly, aka Disco Mommy, self-proclaimed self Disco Mommy, and her son, Joey. At 20 years old, he's the youngest contestant and he's so embarrassed about his mother's free natured spirit. But he thinks his mom is so funny. He can't get over the fact that she was the milf of the manor the whole time. Yeah. Joey, Joey, which yeah. one's your mom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Really want me to point it's her out? So pretty obvious. Like, hey guy, want to go to MILF Manor? <laughs> it's your mother. <laughs> the mother and son sleep in the same suite and talk at the end of the day, which would be wholesome under other circumstances. Though it is funny to watch their reactions as to who they're interested in. You said, come up here, mom. <laughs> Just like a robot. Just like a Oh my god, you gotta be joking, joking! Like his mom is the disco mommy, he has no choice but to just laugh it up and say, all right dude, I'll see you at the gym tomorrow. But every time one of their sons tries to f the disco mommy, they're horrified and they just have to learn to get over it. It's the ultimate ironic consequence for choosing to go on this show in the first place. They realize the mistake they made as soon as they see their Family. The uncomfortable quality is its worst quality, but it's the only reason why it's interesting at all. In the show Love at First Kiss, TLC throws a bone at people who have never kissed anyone before. This dude, he comes in and he has no idea what to do, but still he's all brass tacks. Um, can I kiss you? Sure. He messes it up so badly. They have to bring in a kissing coach. I'm an amateur kissing coach. Okay. I had no idea there was such thing as a kissing coach. I didn't either. After a little practice, he gets back in there, once again getting right to business. Can I kiss you? <laughs> but having done his homework, he's given a little confidence. And with explicit approval, he gets a solid make-out session with a new person. Then they have a date. It's never too late for anyone out there. Have you thought about being kind today? Similarly themed is the show Virgin Coaches starring Bill and Janine, who coach Christian couples who've saved themselves for marriage and are not yet cohabitating. They learn about the realities of living each other and more salaciously, the realities of sex. Shock them into taking this weekend serious. We are gonna do something pretty radical. What are, what are they talking about? Are they gonna f right here and now? Flesh of my flesh. Get in there, coach. Hey, I've read the Bible. It's Adam and Eve, not Bill and Janine. Get yourselves out of the story. Next up, we have a program that caused quite a stir. My husband is not gay, but the audience has all agreed he seemed pretty gay. I don't feel like I fit the mold of guys that are attracted to other men other than my, my deep and abiding love for Broadway show tunes and the attraction to males. Those are the two things that, uh, that, that are kind of gay about me. This show is centered around hetero Mormon couples where the man has rejected and acknowledged attraction to men and adopting the term same sex attracted rather than gay because there's nothing happy about this situation. That's why they have to vent on TV. This one guy has a danger scale. That's right. Uh, danger scale. He says some guys are really hot, but he can't look at them more than once because looking more than once is dangerous and tempting. And I think his take on what he's being tempted to do speaks on why this is a bad idea. I was drugged and forgot that I was married to you and I was in a back alley and well, in some dark corner with romantic music, would anything happen? That's the danger scale. Why do you fantasize about that happening? Find happiness. Please. Tom is the single SSA in the group and all his buddies set him up on a date with a woman. You grew up with dogs? Um, kind of, yeah. What kind? A wiener dog. <laughs> oh, that's a very appropriate one. That's the kind of dog you should get, Tom. I think all of his friends just want him to be happy with who he is. Hear Me, Love Me, See Me feels like a show that should have aired during COVID, but miraculously happened before any of that. It features a woman sitting on a couch as she watches three guys with a GoPro strapped to their bodies so she can hear them, fall for them, and finally see them for the very first time. This was supposed to be TLC's fun twist on like online dating where, you know, you see the person and you judge them automatically. It's like the opposite of Tinder. But then when the guy walks out, you could tell they're just not into them. It's a bummer. <laughs> but 
but like, it's okay to be attracted to the person you're with. He wouldn't want to be with somebody he doesn't find very attractive. I'm shorter than her and I'm shorter than the other two guys. Those ducks that I fed today, those guys can't compete with that. This short king is angry the whole finale. He thought if she couldn't see how small he was, he'd win. But what he doesn't know is when you're tall, you can hear shortness. The show You, Me, and My Ex is about a bunch of people who just need to get their together off of TV. My ex-husband's sperm is in my wife. Play ya, play ya. I guess they needed some sperm they can trust, but okay. But then he starts demanding that that kid call him dad. His ex-wife's new wife is pregnant with his sperm and he thinks he's gonna be a parent in that situation. They asked the wrong person. Can't donate your sperm and then expect all of those people to call you dad. So yeah, this woman's gay best friend became her wife, but her she still hangs out with her ex-husband. And this psycho 54 year old man invites his young girlfriend to come live with him, his ex-wife and all of his children during the peak of COVID and he makes her sleep in their closet. This show is wild and these people definitely need to get their sh together unless they love being on TLC. In that case, keep up the good work. Okay, hot and heavy. This show is about big women and their small guys. We have this sweet woman trying to get fit and feel good about herself, but Rusty, her asshat of a husband, doesn't want his wife to lose weight. I don't want her to change. I don't want Kristen to be any smaller. Matter of fact, I wouldn't mind if she was a little bit bigger. And not just in a like, you're beautiful the way you are, I support you kind of way, but because he thinks it'll make her more attractive to other men and that threatens him. That is f***ed up on like 500 levels. He's very good looking. He's what like is, a pretty what boy. Is, what is this He tries to f*** up her weight loss journey by putting whipped cream and chocolate sauce all over his titties. I'm having this surgery so we can have a baby and look at you, like this is absurd. Like you're, you're not supporting me. What am I supposed to do? Not this, my guy. Literally anything else. Have you tried being kind today? I do it because I love you. No, you just want to keep me fat. In layer three, we'll be talking about shows that have examined family life. Arguably TLC as it is today was built on the many shows about unique families, which first exploded into popularity with the show John Kate plus eight, a couple and their children, two twins and six sextuplets. John and Kate Gosselin's show and destructive breakup were heavily capitalized on and it changed the channel forever. They saw a whole family blow up on TV and said, let's do it again. Over the years, there's been seven little Johnstons doubling down with the Derricos who have 14 kids out daughtered. They have so many daughters, sweet home sex tuplets, the blended bunch, they'll cast anyone. Which inevitably leads to the cancellation of shows like The Willis Family and 19 Kids and Counting. Because cast members sex the children. With so many people being tapped to suddenly become stars, it only feels inevitable that some of them would have committed some heinous crimes. They cast a very wide net. It's not a huge family show, but Gypsy Sisters was canceled too because one cast member killed another's dog. This sucks. And in my mind, there's no doubt the attention these shows has brought on to these people have not helped the situation, making it more difficult to move on from these tragedies. Anyways, here's a quote from a variety issue with the TLC chief Howard Lee for absolutely no reason. I don't agree when I read that someone says our shows go too far. We only cast people who want to really outright wear their hearts on their sleeves and often their lives can be messy and that's real. Going through their entire history of family shows, it never feels like the attention was good for the family. Anyways, welcome to Plathville's about the Plath family who live in rural Georgia and are non-denominational Christians. Kim and Barry, the parents decided that the best thing for their children was to raise them detached from the modern world. They know what a Coke is, but they don't know what a Coke is. Can you believe that? That means no Coca-Cola, no rock and roll, no Spider-Man, but all the kids, they disagree about being prohibited from all of these things. So we get to watch on TV as this family is torn apart. Isn't that just swell? And now the parents are getting divorced. This just ended like all the other shows. Why am I even talking about it? Next, Sister Wives, which spawned a whole slew of copycat shows about polygamists and polyandrists, as in a single wife or husband with multiple other wives or husbands. Sister 
Wives has been airing on TLC since 2010 and tells the story of Cody and his four wives and their 11 kids who all deal with the struggles of sharing one partner and one father. She's a sister from the same mister and he's a brother from another mother. <laughs> In the United States, there are no legal unions between multiple partners. So a lot of the drama comes from who is legally married to Cody and who's just spiritually married within their religion. Cody's wives are friendly, but they don't all love each other equally. But Cody says love is not what's important to him. He needs to be respected. His love doesn't matter to me, respect matters to me. Doesn't really seem like the relationship on any of these shows functioned too well. The idea that all these women put up with this one dude's BS is wild. He's a wiener. That's how I describe him. Oh, but he calls himself the high priest. I am the high priest of my own family. <laughs> but Cody has problems communicating with each one of his wives, let alone all four. And the sacrifices that I made <laughs> to love you. You're like, I'm divorced. I'm leaving. I'm done with you. Man, just the knife in the kidney over all these years. And that's the reason I'm pissed off. And I'm left feeling sad that these people would enter this situation because of how they were raised. But guess what? Literally three of his four wives left him at once. They finally found something to agree on and holy that this show also ended like all of the other ones. Why are we even talking about it? The next season of Sister Wives is gonna be called Me and My Wife. A lot of these family shows attempt to create an air of inclusiveness, such as Little People, Big World, a show about a family of little people, or I Am Jazz about a teenage transgender activist, Jazz Jennings. While reactions to these types of shows have been more skeptical in recent years, TLC used to get a lot of credit for trying to shed light and normalize all sorts of different people. However, if you wanna understand how performative this all is all you have to do is look at the story of All American Muslim, which follows five Islamic families living in Dearborn, Michigan. The show aired in 2011 and ran for only one season due to backlash and advertisers pulling out. The Florida Family Association, in their appeal to the program's advertisers, expressed that TLC was spreading propaganda by excluding extremists. The campaign persuaded Lowe's to pull their advertisements from All American Muslim, stating on Facebook that individuals and groups have strong political and society societal views on this topic, and this program became a lightning rod for many of those views. As a result, we did pull our advertising out of this program. We believe it is best to respectfully defer to communities, individuals, and groups to discuss and consider such issues of importance. And TLC responded to Lowe's by canceling the show after one advertiser boycotted it. Just one. It feels performative. Lair 4 TLC loves to do medical themed shows, such as Dr. Pimple Popper, who got her career started on YouTube. So it's always great to see fellow creators popping off. TLC features a lot of shows about people living with extreme obesity. My 600 pound life started in 2012 and has been running for 11 seasons. Patients turn to doctor now for life changing gastric bypass surgery. People have actually had success losing weight on this show, truly transforming their bodies back to where they can feel independent again. Though hardship has also affected a lot of the cast members. Some have died during their journey, while others have accused TLC of not sticking to the agreed aid they would be receiving to help their journey. More recently though, TLC has aired 1,000 Pound Sisters, which follows two very overweight sisters. To me, the most powerful part of documentary is revealing universal human traits in different scenarios. But despite the air of mistruth on a lot of these TLC shows, I'd be lying to say that sometimes the humanity absolutely slips through. Like when Tammy says this to Amy. Try being my size, Amy. You don't know how it is. Baby, you're the baby. No, you're no, the you're I just want to reach through the camera and say, stop it. You're in this together. I've been grown. I pay my bills. My bills are paid. Sometimes I'm Tammy and other times I'm Amy. I'm either trying to reach somebody or I can't be reached. If I were to take time and list out all the pregnancy shows TLC has aired, we'd be here all day. The show, I didn't know I was pregnant. I think I just had a baby. The most cracked program they've ever aired though is Labor Games, a game show where they surprise women in labor. I mean, they might as well be on a game show while they wait. Welcome to Labor Games. Get the question right and you may receive a new mountain bike or perhaps an Xbox 360 courtesy of Microsoft. What do we have to give you to make your baby seem uncool? We want you to go home and show everybody your brand new pair of AirPods. Untold Stories of the ER is just like sex sent me to the 
ER, which I talked about in the last video, but with a lot more fake blood. So if you don't like that stuff, please skip ahead. I can't have you passing out and ending up on this show. It would be too over the top. This show just wants to be a medical sitcom so badly. Even the doctors and nurses have their own little storylines. The nurse bought a swimsuit because she's going to the beach later, but is interrupted when a guy is rushing in on a boat with a shark clamping onto his inner thigh at the ER. It is dead, isn't it? No, and we can't let it die. I'm an oceanography student. These sharks are amazing creatures. He's losing so much blood, but all of these marine biologists want to make sure the shark has enough water to survive. He makes the nurse get bundles of saline and pop them into the boat for the little shark. But the one thing we were not expecting was for the patient to regain consciousness. <laughs> Now the nurse doesn't even want to go to the beach anymore. She's had enough of the ocean today. Oh, no more beach for me. I returned those bathing suits, so I'm going hiking this summer. Good call. A little full circle with the story there. Now we arrive at the final layer for today, TLC's flops and oddities. Shows that barely made it past the season or that are just so weird. TLC really shoots for any idea that comes across their board. They even had a ripoff of Pawn Stars called Pawn Queens. It only ran for one season. Then sometimes they try to make a show with a celebrity like Sarah Palin's Alaska, the former governor of Alaska, Sarah Palin, but she determined the show might hurt her political career and decided to leave. I wonder how that's going for her. I'm sure a lot of you have no scrubs playing in your head every single time I mention TLC. And my jaw dropped when I heard what Totally t Boz was about. This show is about the lead singer of TLC, Tion Watkins, after the years of hardship she faced following the end of TLC, her band. Finally, TLC and TLC collabing together at last. Now Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Fast Food Chain need to collaborate, like a chili dog thing. They've never done that. Did you know Cracker Barrel the restaurant and Cracker Barrel Cheese aren't the same company either? Like they could do something together. In the early days of TLC, the channel aired Forensics Files, which I'll talk a little bit about next time. Yet true crime has never really found a strong home at TLC. Plenty of shows have followed cops around to document their interactions with the community. TLC tried doing this with their show DUI, where they capture people under the influence and follow their legal cases after their arrest, but it didn't really catch on. Same goes for their other cop shows, their cop show franchise, Police Women. But the one show I had to check out was Mall of America Cops because I have family in Minnesota and I grew up going to this mall every other summer. Paul is blarting it up in the Mall of America as they deal with possible explosives in an abandoned suitcase, the handbag mafia, Sarah Palin there for a book signing crossover episode, and crowd controlling a Demi Lovato signing who doesn't even know they were filming a TV show. I wish they would remake this with modern TLC sensibilities so there could be like cute little character stories every episode. TLC has also never really been a home to like paranormal ghost hunting shows, except for the show Kindred Spirits. There are so many ghost shows as it is, Kindred Spirits to me easily disappears within the crowd, yet somehow it's been going for seven seasons. The two hosts just have really weird chemistry. It seems like one of them is in charge and the other one has already made a few too many mistakes. Yeah, okay. That wasn't me talking. No. That wasn't you talking. I would never say no to you. No. What's the story there? You can say no to your friends. He wasn't afraid of the ghost. He was afraid the ghost would make her mad at him. Another character joins later in the series named Chip, a psychic medium. He's blinded in this one episode and sits in a jail cell trying to communicate with spirits, giving a whole performance. I don't even want to open my eyes. Where is this? Solitary confinement. Sorry. No, Sorry. I, Chip, I hate this. I've seen a lot of ghost shows, and this is definitely one of the more boring ones out there, even with Chip giving it his all. Every single time any of these characters are on screen with each other, it feels like they're trying to one-up each other with how many paranormal experiences they've had within the episode. Wanna say what I just saw on the floor? Wait, you saw something on the floor? Where? Right down there. I'm not even kidding. I just saw a shadow figure. Like chill y'all, you're ruining the suspense. Okay, so My Secret Job feels like another show where people are just f***ing with TLC. It's just about people who have secret weird jobs. Don't forget to hop over and get underneath that ottoman real good. 
this one woman sells her breast milk and her husband markets it. Give me some money for some breast milk. Her husband keeps referring to her as a cash cow. I've got to keep my cash cow going. He sets up this breast milk deal with a bodybuilder who's trying to get some gains with breast milk. He insists he needs it for the particular diet he's on, but that's f***ing bull. You're f***ed up, dude, and you're driving up all the prices for the mothers. You can grow your big ass milkers with some whey protein, I promise. I discussed my strange addiction and my crazy obsession in the last video and how the show is edited to make these people seem so depraved and how a lot of it is staged. If you are familiar, the premise of both shows follows the day of someone with some wild lifestyles, habits, and hobbies. But sometimes I feel like people just go on this show to f*** with TLC. Like one time this woman named Trisha Paytas was on the show saying she had an addiction to tanning. Everyone is gonna die. I'm just gonna die extremely hot. <laughs> I wonder what happened to her. The obsessions are typically less harmful than the addictions, which sometimes include people drinking paint or eating their dead loved one's ashes. Like I love this one kid who is obsessed with collecting fans. Definitely one of the more earnest episodes. He has so many fans and despite being like 10 years old, He's had a lifelong quest to find his favorite fan from when he was an infant. This kid is awesome. Definitely going places. Similarly, there's also Freaky Eaters, which features people with food sensory issues. Like this guy can only eat a dump truck of cheeseburgers. It has to be that many. I don't know, I skimmed over it. Last time we saw how the show Extreme Couponing was also largely faked with some of those cast members even being accused of coupon fraud. But in a parallel world to that show is Extreme Cheapskates. This show follows people so frugal they've just disconnected from life. Like this guy who puts cornstarch all over his body to cool off so he doesn't have to spend money on air conditioning or a self-proclaimed millionaire peeing in a jar to save money on water. They save literal cents by doing all of this weird shit. So eventually you have to ask, is this really about saving money or do you just want to pee in a jar? Quite pungent. Some cheapskates eat out of the trash or boil up some weeds and roadkill for dinner. A lot of it is gross, and a lot of the time people are accusing these families of abusing their children with certain cheap methods. But I just don't believe it. Just see myself in the plate. In one episode, this woman's husband begs her to let him have the guys over to watch the game, but she's concerned about the electric bill and spending money on snacks. But nonetheless, she makes them all a lasagna. In the dishwasher, that's enough of this fucking shit. And just like extreme couponing, of course, this show has also been accused of being fake as well. Melody Rose Gravit or the hillbilly cheapskate explained to her local newspaper that they made her family seem like she was using newspaper as toilet paper, which was just not the case, is not real, which makes you question all of the other ridiculous things that people do in this show. She described the end product as 90% untrue. Now we have the third failed entry in the Extreme series. We had Extreme Couponers, Extreme Cheapskates, and now Extreme Time Cheaters. This is so stupid. These are people who try to save time in their daily routine by multitasking in insane ways, like shaving their legs in the pool, like using the bottom of a hot coffee pot to iron your clothes, or I eat fiber supplements so I can go number two as fast as I go number one. But this guy, he's too much. He blends all of his food because he has no time to chew. Look at him, no chill at all. Take a breath, guy. His sister sets him up with a date because she thinks he's a great guy. I mean, he helps out orphans and whatnot, but man is on a tight schedule, so he times his dates. He rushes by ordering all the food at once, and then he asks his date if he could feed her. Let me feed you there. Uh, no, that's okay. Okay. Do you really think you can make her eat faster by doing that? Uh, can I get uh, these blended? Blended? He just sucks down his salad. The, the date does not end the way he expected it to. All I want to do is find a woman that will one day tolerate me. Not love me, just tolerate me. Am I getting sucked into the drama of a TLC show knowing it's fake? All right, best funeral ever only lasted for a season and a half starting in 2013. The Golden Gate Funeral Home in Texas provides its services to families who want to celebrate their past loved ones by throwing a themed funeral. The family of gold medal Olympian Ronnie Ray Smith wanted to celebrate him by throwing a track meet where he can run one last time. Golden Gate figures out how they can make it happen for him. How does one make a coffin go fast? 
just put it on a go-kart. Of course. I do think this show is fun. It's, it's showcasing these going home celebrations, which really is just a fun spirited way to honor a loved one who has passed away. It's one of the more wholesome and ridiculous shows at the same time. All right, here we are at the very bottom at the earliest show on our list. A preview to the kind of weird stuff we might see next time. Honey, we're killing the kids. Originally, this show was a BBC Three series, but was adapted for American audiences in 2007 on TLC. Before TLC became a reality show hellscape, they had a trouble figuring out their identity. And this show really exemplifies that. Different specialists like Dr. Melfi and her crew show parents a Photoshop prediction of what their children will look like in adulthood. If they keep raising them the way they are. They try to integrate healthy eating habits for the family to apply, but I just feel so bad for the kids likeness being all up like that. Like if I saw that at nine years old, I would have some deep rooted issues, especially as I grew up to look like that. This show would permanently kill anyone's self-esteem. It's a core memory for every child who is on it, I guarantee. TLC, making core memories for children since its beginning. But what's the wildest thing about the TLC story is all of this crazy stuff came from a channel that you used to be able to get college credits through. I'm not kidding. The learning channel was actually about learning. And the story of how TLC became what Discovery made it today is a wild deep dive. So tune in next time as we tell the story of how the learning channel covertly became TLC. See ya.